there's all sorts of things that I think that we do because in the back of our minds we think, oh, that might be bad luck. Welcome to 100 Years, 100 Objects, stories from the collections of Lancaster City Museums. My name is Rachel Roberts and I'm the Collections Registrar for Lancaster City Museums. In this series, we're celebrating 100 years of our museums by looking in depth at 100 of our favourite objects and the stories that they can tell. In this episode, we're looking at an object which is a little bit magical, or at least it tells us about a time when magic was part of everyday life, and there is a whole range of objects which claim to be able to protect you from its power. Today's object is a hagstone. The hagstone is an odd but rather unremarkable object to look at. It is simply an irregular shaped stone tied onto a thin piece of leather strap. The stone is somewhere between a rough teardrop shape and a semicircle and is about six centimetres across at the widest point. It's attached to about four centimetres of leather strap which crucially passes through a hole in the middle of the stone. There are no markings or patterns on the stone and without some knowledge of hagstones you would be forgiven for thinking that it might be some kind of tool or even a weapon. But in fact, hagstones were charms, said to protect people from the magic which they believed was all around them. We spoke to Alice Rouncefield, museum assistant at Lancaster City Museum and project officer for the King's Own Royal Regiment Museum, who let us in on some of this object's magical secrets. This is a witch charm from a farm in Pilling, where it hung in the cow house with other more orthodox medicines. So hagstones, you might also have heard them called fairy stones, odin stones, holy stones or witch stones. There seems to be lots of different names for them kind of regionally. I think it probably applies. It might be something different where you come from. There's several origin stories for hagstones. Some say they're formed when snakes dribble poison they're stones that have a naturally occurring hole through them maybe a couple of them and they're usually found near bodies of water if water gets into a rock or into a mineral it would slowly erode it and it might create a hole or it might create several we're not sure how long people have referred to them as hagstones and like i said before there's many other names for them and it doesn't seem to be something that's just in the uk either hag or a hag in western culture at least is usually seen as like a haggard ugly old woman that usually has a malevolent presence however that's not the case all over the world sometimes they're seen as a neutral force that help to aid heroes the three fates were seen as hags but usually they're seen in western culture like with hansel and gretel trapping children in ovens or cursing people so a hag stone prevent you from being cursed so this hagstone was hung in a barn on a farmyard, but Alice explains that they could be found almost anywhere and their uses were almost endless. A hagstone could be used in, maybe you'd call it in sympathetic magic, for a lot of different reasons. So they were said to be maybe powerful protection talismans, you could wear them and it would protect the bearer from curses, hexes, negative spirits and harm. Also they could be used to prevent nightmares and things like that. However something that's also quite common is for them to be hung up in a farm or a barn to protect animals from disease. So that's probably why it was hung up in a farm. And that's what I think is so interesting. I think when you start looking into hagstones and what their possible uses were or what people use them for, it's such a wide range. Some people might actually know or have seen a hagstone in a movie called Coraline where there's a a stone or a rock with a naturally occurring hole in that you can look through to see another realm or see fairy folk. So the uses seem to be very wide ranging. We aren't sure exactly when a hagstone is from. They were in use for many hundreds of years and were steeped in a culture where magic and witchcraft were not only believed to be part of everyday life, but were acknowledged and criminalised by all the major authorities and places of power. Alice explained how this would lead to most people believing in the existence of magic, and therefore the charms and counterspells that were supposed to protect them. At the time, the public would be looking towards the monarchy, the church, laws that were in place, and all of those things were saying the witchcraft was real and it was something that should be punishable by death and that was a real issue in society at the time, which really 
contributed to the paranoia of people in both worrying about witchcraft and also believing that it is the root cause of their problems but also in maybe accusing people of witchcraft as well especially people that were marginalized or that they viewed as odd there's all there's been a great deal of believable evidence given by different people claiming to be witches or to use magic so this was definitely something that would have seemed very much believable that this would affect your life in the 16th and 17th centuries lancashire was a particularly fertile environment for stories of witchcraft to grow leading to one case in 1612 which many people may have heard of so something that people listening might already know about is that in Lancashire, England, it was kind of a hot zone for witchcraft in the early 17th century. So particularly Pendle Hill or the Pendle Hill witches people might know about. So in 1612, Pendle Hill became a focus of paranoia when 20 people faced accusations of witchcraft during the Lancashire witch trials. Local authorities were suspecting people of witchcraft, usually the these were marginalised people who were kind of very easy to pick on and blame. Later in the year of 1612, authorities submitted 20 names for a trial for the crimes of witchcraft. The majority of the suspects were women. There were a few men named in the indictment as well, but some of the names people might be aware of are Elizabeth Susand, who was known as Demdike, Elizabeth Device, daughter of Demdike, um, there's James Device, brother of younger Elizabeth, Alice Device, sister of James, Anne Whittle, who was known as Chattox, Anne Redfern, daughter of Chattox, Alice Nutter, Catherine Hewitt, Mold Heels, I believe she was known as. In modern times, the evidence that was put forward and used in the trial was flimsy and weak at best, and it really wouldn't have stood up in a court of law today. Something that's quite important to add as well is that people did confess. So, for example, Demdike had a pact with the devil. So she faced accusations of selling her daughter to the devil and her subsequent grandchildren as well. She did state that 20 years before her arrest, she was on her way home when a devil in the form of a boy stopped her and asked for her immortal soul. In exchange, she would receive anything that she desired she used this to say that she was a witch and she was in cahoots with the devil. So when you might have somebody quite plainly confessing to being a witch or involved with witchcraft, this was quite hard evidence in the public's mind of magic and of witches. At the end of the trial, many of those accused were found guilty and executed, and Alice explained how the king at the time, James I, was another key factor in why these Lancashire people lost their lives for doing magic. In 1597, King James the Sixth of Scotland published a compendium on witchcraft law called Demonology. It was published in England in 1603 when James took the English throne as well. Um, the book Demonology asserts James's full belief in magic and witchcraft, and it aims to both prove the existence of such forces and to also lay down what sort of trial and punishment these practices merit in James's view, this was death. So this was obviously a book that was really important at the time and really did contribute to the idea that witches and witchcraft were a real element to everyday reality. But witches were not the only magical force that were believed in in the 17th century. And we still tell stories now. Alice told us about her favourite folklore figure from Lancashire. So my particular favourite folklore tale or folklore figure in Lancashire that seems to be quite prevalent around Lancaster is a boggart. So people might know the word boggart or know about a creature called a boggart from Harry Potter. So I think in Harry Potter they're these creatures that hide in cupboards and they transform into something that you are most scared of. But boggarts typically in our Lancashire folklore, 
are slightly similar. They can live in a home, but also they live outside. They take on various forms. So they could look like your washing flying away, I think is one of the stories that I've read. They could also look like sort of a bold, hairy, small man. So they take a lot of different shapes. Um, but they quite often like to hide in holes and in marshes. A boggart was very much a malevolent figure. They would quite often be blamed if children went missing or people went missing, especially in the marshes. So they could be used as an explanation maybe for someone being lost or someone never coming back or something awful happening in kind of a marshy area. Boggarts allegedly come about when you are cruel or mean to a brownie or a fairy. So they originally start out as good entities, but then if you're mean to them, they go bad. You must not give them a name, otherwise they will never leave you alone. As a final thought, Alice expressed how she thinks that the kind of magical thinking that was prevalent in the time of hagstones and witch trials is still part of our modern day life even if we might not recognise it. So I'm really interested in what people might call superstition or magical thinking. It's very easy to brush off as something that maybe, oh, it's irrational or it's not scientific thinking. But I think a lot of us still use magical thinking every day. So as an example, my dad, who's a very clever man, he, whenever he sees a magpie, he has to make the motion to spit over his shoulder because there's a superstition that if you don't greet a magpie then you'll have bad luck especially if you see just one but also things that I think people might not realize are magical thinking you know even things like wearing a wedding veil why do we wear a wedding veil actually originally it was about protection do people have a favorite pair of underpants because they think they're good luck or something or would you not walk under a ladder although that's not a good idea anyway there's all sorts of things that I think that we do because in the back of our minds we think oh that might be bad luck like maybe you pick up a penny if it's face up or something like that that actually are indicative of magical thinking aren't they so I would be really interested to know whether people consider themselves superstitious if they don't consider themselves superstitious and if they still have some sort of magical thinking in their everyday lives thank you for spending a spell with us today why not conjure up some of our other episodes where we talk about everything from astronomy to abolition 